Hi, I'm Kathy Fleischer, and I'm the editor of NCTE's Principles and Practice imprint. And today you're going to get a chance to learn about one of the books in the imprint by hearing from its author, Stephen Alvarez. First, let me tell you a little bit about Principles and Practice. Um, all of the books in this imprint are designed to offer teachers concrete illustrations of effective classroom practices that are based in various NCTE research briefs and policy statements. The books all have a similar design. Each one discusses research on a specific topic, then links the research to an NCTE brief or policy statement, and then demonstrates how those principles come alive in practice. Um, the books are grouped together in strands that are based on particular policy statements, um, from some on adolescent literacy, to writing in today's classrooms, to literacy assessment, to literacy in the disciplines, to reading instruction, and most recently, to English language learners. As I said, we're gonna be chatting today with Steve Alvarez, who's the author of a book in this new English language learner strand. The book is entitled Community Literacies in Confianza, Learning from After School Programs. Steve's an assistant professor of English at St. John's University in New York. His research examines the language and literacies of emergent bilingual Latino and Latina communities. He has a decade of experience teaching writing to students from kindergarten through college and communities across the U.S and most recently in China and Mexico. So welcome, Steve. We're glad to have you here to talk about your book. Hello, thank you. Thanks for having me and um, greeting to all of you out there and potential readers, please check it out. Right, so can you start by telling us a little bit about the book and what inspired you to write it? Well, the, the research builds on, on previous research I had done with uh, Mexican immigrants in New York and after school programs. Uh, in that case in New York, that was where I, I Actually, have another book that came out around the same time with SUNY, uh, really examining how after-school spaces become bilingual spaces, and oftentimes meeting a community need where uh, communities feel maybe not welcome or their home language feels unwelcome in certain educational spaces. So I had done a lot of research in New York with Mexican immigrants who set up a grassroots kind of uh, after-school program, homework support, that was literally in the basement of a church, in a donated space. So there was not a lot of resources. There was not a lot of heat. Uh, you know, families were bringing blankets and hot chocolate just to stay warm so they could do homework. But it was also, I think, a testament to the lengths the families were willing to go to get homework help in English for their children. Well, I moved to Kentucky when I started the job at the University of Kentucky. And in Kentucky, I found something interesting and comparable. And this is where this book came in. Uh, I met two different after-school programs. One was at a bilingual public library, which offered after-school support as well, although with support from the state and really in, in the space of a library, but doing the exact same thing I saw happening for folks in, in New York. And then an after-school program uh, I also met, or met some of the members of were as a high school group. And this was a group of Latino students who often, more likely than not, or more often than not, met in uh, English language learner classes and they were grouped together and they maintained friendships that they extended outside of school and after school and places where they could speak in English and Spanish in, in more liberating ways, I think, than the school curriculum really mandated. So the, the research for this book was um, my time living in Kentucky, getting to know about folks there, getting to know about the Latinx community, um, and also really teaching me what it was like to be Latino in Kentucky, in the South. I'm from Arizona, Mexican American by background. And this space in Kentucky was teaching me a lot about what the transformations the South was experiencing, but also the demographic transformations linguistically our nation is facing and how spaces outside of schools are spaces for education as well. That's so great. Can you um, explain a little bit about the title, the In Confianza part of it? Yeah. That means? Absolutely, uh, well, I think, my research is, is, is ethnographic based. I'm an educator as well. And I think a tool that comes from doing ethnographic research is being embedded in a community. But it's not that easy. It's not as if one can parachute in, do one's field work and leave. You really have to develop a sense of rapport and a kind of a, a way of understanding that one can build relationships of trust. Trust being the utmost, uh, of the utmost importance. In Spanish, there's a term called confianza, which looks like confidence, and it is something to do with confidence, but it really has to do with sustained trust. Because so much of my ethnographic research, I realized, was really being a part of a community and an advocate for a community. 
and, and especially when I was working with young folks who needed help with their homework and I got to know the families, I realized it was also important for me as a mentor, uh, someone who as a first generation college student and a first generation professor, it's my duty to go into my communities and learn about my communities and share my story, but also uplift the voices and the stories that are in the community that sometimes become omitted. So the mentorship aspect is really what I draw on confianza. And in this book, I, I really go into some of the, the relationships I have with families, with members of the community, with the students, and how that bond of trust becomes something that is necessary uh, for all educators and really important, especially if we think about understanding the lives of our students and the dignity of their lives and their family lives. So the confianza, uh, you'll know, and you'll maybe if you have friends in Spanish, and you say something that is en confianza, and it means in a, in a kind of trust, which is, is good. And also, you know, it can be something that might be um, beyond the realms of developing a classroom relationship with the student, really understanding the community students come from. Yeah, and I, I love the way you just stated that because one of the things that I find so compelling about this book are the stories of the kids and the way you relate the stories of the kids, their voices and their presence just comes alive so so beautifully in the book. Um, so that leads me to my next question. What do you hope yeah. that teacher readers will take from this book? If I'm a teacher teaching English someplace and a member of NCTE, what would I take from this book that would help me as a teacher? I think the, the great thing about this book is that it's, it's short enough where you can read it in the afternoon and there's also a lot of tips and different kind of texts that you can bring into a class. Uh, I was just speaking to a group of graduate students the other day, and uh, I believe they were in Milwaukee. And one of the, uh, the students who was actually first year writing, but also you know, taught some high school as well, said, well, what do I do if I have students who are not speaking English from multiple countries in my classroom, where it's not just Spanish, it might be from six different languages in addition to you know, learning English. And there's a lot of different tools that we can bring into the classroom. Uh, in, in the book, I give a few examples, and I give a, an example of a, uh, a documentary, a short documentary, a short film, and there's a lot of short films on YouTube uh, that really go into some of the politics of language diversity and what this means for certain students to be compelled to subtract their home languages, and then for other students to have the additive experience of being bilingual. Uh, think of all the young folks who take classes to learn French or even to learn Mandarin or something. Uh, and of course, having English as their home language, and then how this might translate differently to a student of an immigrant background, where English may not be the home language. But all the same, uh, there's a lot of tips and places you can think about, maybe not so much changing your entire curriculum, although that challenge is certainly there, but small lessons you could do, low stakes assignments, writing assignments, and ways where you can bring up uh, and honor the voices of the students, to get the, the students to think about themselves and their expertise, and uh, their knowledge of their communities as being sort of the highlight uh, that we can all learn. Um, you mentioned before about the voices of the students. When I, the students I met in Kentucky, I introduced them to uh, Chicano poets, poets who were writing in English and Spanish, and the students had never read that before. So we read more, and then we started writing, and the students, when they started sharing their stories and stories of their families and different exercises with writing, were really, really powerful. So if anything else, I hope it will give teachers at all levels ways to think about uh, engaging texts that are multilingual and also engaging those multilingual gifts of their students. That's wonderful. Well, I hope as you're listening to this, this inspires you to read more of this book. Um, I think it's an amazing book and it really demonstrates uh, for me, who mostly teach students who speak English as their main language, but I have some students who come in, uh, speakers of other languages. It really inspires me to think about things that I could do with them and hope it'll inspire all of you too. So thanks Steve so much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you.